Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Hardin Baptist Church this middle of March, March 17th. And I see a bunch of green out in the crowd today. I guess there's some St. Patrick's Day thing going on. I don't know, but so if, if you're sitting next to someone who's not wearing green, please don't pinch your neighbor. Just be nice. All right. If you would stand with me today as we sing together 916 from one of our other hymns, What a Day That Will Be. We'll do all stanzas. be a glorious day. Amen? Amen. Be all right if we go today. Amen. It really will. Good to see you this morning. Glad y'all are here. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Almighty God, we want to tell you that we love you. We are so looking forward to that wonderful, glorious day when we see you face by face, face to face, Lord, and uh, walk side by side with you through your good glories of heaven, Lord. And we want to thank you that we have the privilege and opportunity to, to think about it and to enjoy it down here and to know that it's coming, Lord, and to know your presence in our daily lives as well. Now, Lord, this is your day. This is the Lord's day, the Lord's hour, the Lord's place, the Lord's people, the Lord's time, the Lord's everything. So, Lord, we want everything to be for your honor and your glory. Strengthen us and encourage us for us to sing your praises, to open our hearts, Lord, to draw nearer to you, to learn from you and about you, and just draw nearer to the, to the Lord God Almighty. Bless us with your presence, your power. We love you. We thank you. We praise you, blessed and holy, in an almighty name. In Jesus' lovely and infinite name, we all pray. And everybody said. Amen. Amen. Say hi to your neighbor. Shake a hand. Have a seat. Get comfortable. Welcome to our weekly family reunion. Glad you guys are here. Glad all of our visitors are here. Uh, this is uh, Easter month. Okay. When we focus on the uh, death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So a couple of extra things we have going is the, uh, uh, our annual egg hunt is Saturday the 30th. Uh, information's in the bulletin. I think they still need some candy and some eggs and all that. So uh, help us out with that. That's always a good time for the kids. We always try to tell them, you know, 
The real meaning of Easter is not about a, a bunny rabbit and eggs. It's really about what? The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? That's what it's all about. So we appreciate all that. Also, remember that on Easter Sunday, which is two weeks from today, we'll have our, uh, uh, our sunrise service again, as usual. It'll be at 7 o'clock up at the Family Life Center. We'll uh, talk about Jesus, sing a few songs, eat a donut or two, something like that, and enjoy a little time together. So that's two weeks from today, Easter Sunday morning, 7 o'clock. And then all our regular services, Sunday school and worship as per usual on those days. Anyway, it's all in here. And uh, you just, you know what? You just don't know what else to do. Just come on down to church. See what's happening, okay? No, don't do that. Spring break week, everybody's gone, right? Having a good week, and that's great as well. Keep everybody in your prayers. A lot of people traveling, and a lot of people have a lot of needs and problems, and we still have sick folk to pray for. But also in the month of, uh, of March we, is our time to focus on our North American missions. We have missionaries, and we have church planters, and we have uh, seminaries, and we have uh, crisis pregnancy centers. We have a long, long list of ministries that we as Southern Baptists do in North America. And so every, every year at this time, we have an Annie Armstrong emphasis. We pray for these people, learn a little bit more about them, and we give an extra offering. So if you uh, want to make a donation to the Annie Armstrong offering, then just put that in your little envelope, drop it in the uh, uh, offering place. There's one in all four corners here. And, uh, and, and, but really, really pray for these people because it's tough out there. Amen? It's tough out there. I think uh, we, we saw one family went to Las Vegas. I'm glad that's not me. Amen? I don't go to Vegas. <laughs> And that last week, we, we heard from a, a mixed martial arts uh, uh, guy. He, that's what he does for a living. He, he's a cage fighter for a living. I'm glad that's not me. <laughs> right? Huh? Yeah. But anyway, God can use anyone in any way. And we thank you for all those ministries. Here's a video about our, our Annie Armstrong. There are so many that don't know Jesus in the city of Boston. I lead the Beloved Initiative, which is an anti-trafficking and sexual abuse awareness campaign. My ministry right now looks like reaching our refugee friends and their families, our homeless friends, and also women who are experiencing exploitation. There are so many parts to the equation. We look for, you know, creative ways to, you know, meet needs. I'm really passionate about gifting essential products, but it's the importance of leaving the pews and going out and being the light and love of Jesus. We have volunteers within our churches. We're creating, you know, earrings and bracelets to then use those for our street outreach. We can um, just bless um, women that are in strip clubs or on the street. And the goal is just really that the loss will be reached with the love of Christ. When people give to the Annie Armstrong offering, uh, individuals are receiving Christ and realizing their beloved identities as beloved sons and daughters. Your generous support is going towards so many individuals who do not have a relationship with Jesus, helping them realize that they are loved and loved by Christ. Amen. Everybody needs Jesus, right? Amen. Did Jesus just die for good people? He just died for people. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad that somebody got the gospel to you? Amen. Right? Now, where I grew up, there were churches all over the place. Right? They did. They were just everywhere. And, it's, and we're very, very blessed to have ample opportunities to hear the gospel. It's just not that way in a lot of places in the United States. Pray for your country. I know it's an election year and all that stuff, but I'll tell you what. If we get us a big old dose of Jesus here, we don't have to worry about anything else. Amen? Uh, so pray for your country. All right. Brother Ernie's going to help us come. We're going to sing some more. You did good on the first one. Amen. Right? Let's see you top that one on these others. Come on, Brother Ernie. Well, before we get going with our next song, I just want to take a quick moment and say thank you to Brother Dennis for filling in for me last week. I heard he did a great job, and uh, I'm thankful that we have people in our church and congregation that are willing to step up and serve the Lord. We'll continue our worship today with Heaven Came Down. We'll do all three stanzas. Yeah. 
Next we'll sing another two, two phrase, but precious Lord, take my hand. Last but not least, we'll do all three stanzas of There's a Land That is Fairer Than Day, and that's that we stand on the last stanza. Would you pray us into our sermon? Father, we want to thank you for this morning, for the spirit, Father, that's here today, Lord. And Father, Lord, I lift up Brother Johnny to you right now. Father, let thy spirit flow through him in a mighty way. Father, open our hearts, Lord, let us hear from you, Lord. Everyone that's here today, Father, 
We could say we needed to have a closer walk with you, Lord. And many times, Father, we go astray. And I pray, Father, if you speak into our heart today that we just come to you and get things right. Oh, Father, there's one here today that doesn't know you, your first Lord and Savior. And if you knock it on their heart's door, they do it, Lord. I pray that they respond to you and walk this aisle and give their life to you, Lord. Oh, Father, we're going to thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother John. Thanks. Good morning again. Good morning. It's good to see you at the Lord's house today. Thanks for being here. Have you ever been broken? Have you ever hit what you thought was rock bottom? Have you been confused and find out that what you thought you knew, you didn't know? We're going to look at uh, the Apostle Peter back when he was just Simon. And we're going to look at the worst day of his life. Now, your job this morning is to identify with Simon. You know, we're all Christians. I hope we're all Christians. We know Jesus is our Savior. We know a little about the Bible, a little bit about doctrine. We know, understand about faith. We've been through trials and temptations and all these things, and we're still standing. Amen? Amen. But there are things about the will of God and the plans of the Lord that are beyond our pay grade, beyond our understanding. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And from time to time, we're called to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. This is what happens to Peter, and it's sometimes it's what happens to us. So stand with me for the reading of the Word of God. We all know the story about how Peter's going to get sifted, and he's going to deny the Lord how many times? Before what happens? Before the rooster crows, all right? Three times he's going to deny. Well, let's read this story and, and uh, see what this has to say about me and you. And again, your, ident- your job is to identify with Peter. Put yourself in his shoes. Think from his perspective. And listen to what the story of Peter has to say to you about your heart and your life and your experiences, okay? So here's what the Bible says, Luke chapter 22, verse 31 says this. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Yeah. Then Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. Hmm? And then the next verse, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays, they come in there to get arrested, he meets the betrayer, and here's what happens next. Having arrested Jesus, this is Judas and the the big mob, they brought him to the high priest's house, but Peter followed at a distance. Now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You are also are, are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. 
And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we want to tell you that we're sorry for all that you had to go through. But we're so very glad you did. Thank you for your love and your mercy, for your compassion. Thank you, Lord, for as the song says, you look beyond our, our fault and see our needs. And Lord, we pray that this morning you'll help us as we identify with this poor old disciple who uh, made a, a complete mess of uh, all that he had intended to do for you, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for all of us. We've all failed and we've all fallen short. And we've all broken our own promises, Lord. And we just want to say thank you that you have gotten us through it just like you did Simon Peter so long ago. I ask now that you'd fill me with your spirit to bring this message for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' holy and almighty and lovely name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Satan himself, the king of demons, the sin god, marched boldly before the throne of God and demanded that he be given Simon Peter and all the others as well. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. And so with vile, venomous speech, the devil accused Peter before God. Peter, Simon, he's, a, he, he's all wind. He's a bully and a braggart. He's sinful. And if you'll give me the chance, I will sift him as wheat. And we'll all know the, what an abject failure he really is. I will break him and grind him to powder. And we will just see and prove that this man who you call the rock is nothing but a handful of sand in the wind. Give him to me. He's a rebel. He's a liar. He's a sinner. He belongs to me. Satan has asked for you. God forbid that Satan should ever ask for me or you. Mm -hmm. But there's another voice in the courtroom of heaven that day. Jesus says, Simon, uh, the, the Satan's after you. He's, he's made his case, but I've prayed for you. Now from the words and from the heart, from the voice of Jesus, it goes a lot more like this. True. Simon is a sinner. True. He's about to deny me three times. True. All these things are true. He's a, he's a bully and a braggart and he's full of hot air and he makes promises he can't keep and he thinks he's strong. All these, it's absolutely true. But here's something also is true. That Simon Peter is beloved. He's precious. Underneath all that, there's a good heart. And for all of his sins, there's going to be the blood of the Lamb of God. To wash them all away. So everything that the devil says that is true about Simon is all going to be removed, washed by the blood of the almighty son of God on that cross. And what will be left will be what God gave to him. Peter don't know this yet. He's up in the garden of Gethsemane. You know, he's snoozing. And Jesus said, Peter, can you not watch me one hour? Well, apparently not. But Lord, I'm ready to go. I am ready to go. You know, I'm with you 100%, Jesus. You know, I got my little, I got my sword right here. Yeah, I've made my brag. You know, others may deny you. Others may betray you. But Lord, not me. I'm your guy. All right? I'm your right-hand man. I got this covered. You can count on me. I know what's up. I know your plans. I know what's going on. Yes, sir. I'm all in with you, dear Jesus. Amen? Have you ever been there? Oh, yeah. Now, we go to church and we get pumped, in theory. The Lord does answer us a prayer. We're like, I'm good to go with Jesus. And then it gets dark in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus has been praying great drops of blood, and there's a great big crowd. The Bible says there's a, <laughs> crowds of them came, a big mob with swords. And what else? Well, the torches, right? And they're kind of swords and clubs is what it said, all right? Swords and clubs, here they come. Hundreds of them. 
And here's Judas leading the pack, all right? We talked about this last week. They come up there, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am. And they all fell down. They got back up. And, who are you looking for? And Jesus of Nazareth. And here's Peter. He, this, this is his moment, right? He's made his brag. He's got his faith up. He's ready to go. And he knows what's happening. He understands what's required of him. He said, Lord, shall we strike? And he put, look, Peter pulls out his little dinky sword. And Peter charges hundreds of armed men by himself. Give him his props. Amen. He put, he, here's a fellow and he takes a swing at his head. But he's a fisherman, not a swordsman. And he manages to cut the man's ear off. Simon means hearing, by the way. And a man named Hearing cut off a, a guy's ear. I don't know what that means, but it's funny. Anyway, it's because Peter says, I, I told you. I told you, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison. I'm ready to go to death. He pulls out a sword. He takes off a man's ear. You know, he's by the Lord just a second, just a minute. He's buying him some time so Jesus can escape. Or Jesus could do one of those miracles and part them all out the Red Sea and they'll just march right out there and be about the business. And Jesus turned to Peter and rebuked him. Peter, put away your sword. He said, I guess my father, 12 legions of angels. If I wanted to leave, I'd go. And Jesus reached down and, he, and healed the man's ears. And everything Peter thought he knew fell apart in his hand. There's no miracles. There's no freedom. There's no life. There's no great words of Jesus. There's no, there's no nothing. God had just, everything, everything he thought he understood, all of a sudden it wasn't true. And he didn't know what was up. And the plans he made, it, 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 it crumbled on him. And he watched as they, as they bound Jesus and put him in chains and, and tied his hands together. And Jesus said, are you looking for me? Then let these go. And the devil said, you got a deal. And boy, and, and go they went. Like a cubby quail. All 11 of them took off running. And Peter's around. He dropped his sword. And in fear and confusion and darkness and desperation... And a renewed sense of self-preservation. He took off running in the darkness. Through the trees around the bushes. And the limbs and the trees are pulling and gripping at him. And you hear this voice in his ear saying, liar, coward, run, sinner. Somehow in the darkness, Peter found enough courage to follow the mob back to the high priest's house. And the high priest's house up there, and here's Jesus out on the porch here, and there got all this band of armies and soldiers and, and accusers and all this going on. And Jesus has been beaten, slapped around. He's in, he's in chains. His hands are bound. He looks rough. But Peter has got to know what's going to happen. Did Jesus not tell him earlier? I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'll be betrayed. I'll be arrested. I will die. Rise again the third day. Did Jesus ever did he tell them that? That's right. But did they hear it? Amen. Simon, whose name means hearing, he didn't hear that. He said, he said, Lord, be it far, this is not going to happen. Lord, be it far from you. That'll never happen to you. No, there's no way. I mean, you're, you're the Christ, the Son of God. And remember what Jesus told Peter at that time. Get thee behind me, Satan. You don't know anything about the kingdom of God. You don't know what this is all about. So here's Simon Peter scratching his head and hiding out in the darkness, but he's got, he's got to know. He's out there warming by the devil's fire, right? Because it's cold at Passover week in Jerusalem. And he's listening and he's watching. And then this loud mouth woman walks up. <laughs> hey, aren't you one of his? No, not me. Because he's thinking they know, they suspect. I'm surrounded by the enemies. 
I see what they're doing to him. I'm next. And it terrified him. And he denied the Lord. And a guy walks up to him and says, Oh, yeah, I think I saw you in the garden with this man. Man, I tell you, I ain't none of his, and I don't know anything about him. Because remember, Peter is a fisherman from Galilee, and they, are, they, have a, they have a hick accent up there. An hour later, he's, st he's, he's still hiding out. An hour later, some other fellow comes up and says, Yeah, you're one of his, and I recognize your accent. You're a Galilean. You're one of his. And Peter snaps. He's so full of fear. He's so confused that, he, that his old fisherman's mouth gets kicked in the gear. And he cusses a blue streak in the air. And he swears an oath. He, says, he said, I swear to God, I don't know that man. Have you ever been there? Oh, I would never deny the Lord. Oh, you would too. Have you been in a place where what you thought you knew <coughs> fell apart? <coughs> that, you, that you thought you knew what was up. You, and you thought that you knew the will of God. While you'd loved him and served him and done all these good things for the Lord. You'd studied your Bible and built up your faith. And you, I mean, you had worked at it and you had learned and you thought okay I got some good understanding here and I know what prayer is about I know what faith is about and I know how to name it and claim it from the word of God and I'll ask God stuff and he's going to answer my prayers and we're going to be partners in this life and it's all going to all be good oh there'll be little dips along the way but, but me and God we've got it made and I'll walk through the valley of shadow death but I will not fear any evil and we build ourselves up and this is all a good thing but but there comes a time in our lives from time to time, sadly, when all that you thought you knew falls apart in your hand. That what you thought you, what you believed about God's will and the plans he had for you just dissipated like pouring water onto the dry sand. It's gone. That ever happened to you? Well, it's happened to me. And I tell you, that's a deep, cold hole. And I hope I don't ever have to go back to a place like that. But I don't know if I will or not. Because oddly enough, God, your heavenly Father, gives Satan permission to sift you like wheat. Why? Why? Well, we're going to get eternal reward for it, you know, and all these things. And that's great. But here's, here's, here's one of the things that I learned. Is that what I thought I knew of God and the way that I thought things worked and the plans that I figured that God had and all these things. All my, all, it was based on, it was based on what I thought I knew. It was based on my faith, my belief, my experience. It was bad, and we would never say this to God out loud, but even the disciples would do this. Lord, I've done this and this and this and this for you. You know, haven't I? Now, you're God and I'm not, but I'm your servant. Now, I've been a dandy, right? I've been to church and I've done the right thing. You remember, all, you, I've turned that other cheek and I've given to the, I've done all this good stuff for you. And, and, I don't, and you're worth it and, and it's great and I'm not begrudge it, but I'm just a reminder. So Peter says, Lord, we've given up everything for you. What do we get in return? He asked him that. And the problem is, though, that, that, that God knows that our trust is not really in him. Our trust is in our understanding of our theology. Our trust is in our faith. Our trust is in our ability to know and understand the will of God. And even a, even a little degree of separation between you and him is unacceptable in the eyes of God. Man. God says, listen, all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. And the next verse Man. tells you what the purpose is. 
For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. God said, I want to make you like Jesus. I don't care what it takes. And anything that stands between you and your Christ likeness is fair game to God. Even your understanding of your faith. Now there are a few things that we know and we just know. God loves you. Jesus died for you. Rose again from the dead. You ask him to save you. You're saved. That's it. There's some things like that. It's, it's right. I mean, it doesn't require any interpretation, any application. It's just carved in stone. Here's the truth. But we build our faith on that. We work on our understanding. And this is good. It's what we're supposed to be doing. But you can't move your trust away from the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not even for the knowledge of the Lord and the truth of the Lord and your faith in the Lord and your service for the Lord. All that is good and well and it's, you're supposed to do it and it's required and commanded of God. But that is supposed to be the fruit on the ends of the, uh, of the, of the branches of your tree of obeying the will of God. It is not the heart and soul. It is not the root. The root is that you are clean to him and him only. And if you put your trust in anything else in the world, anything, including your particular understanding of your particular flavor of your doctrine and the things that you believe about this, that, and the other, even if you put that between you and God, it's fair game to God. Now here's Peter. What he thought he believed was not working out at all. Now, the good news is we know what happens three days later, right? Right? So we know there's a happy ending. But we're not there yet. What about you in, the, in, in your time? In your time in that, in that cold, dark hole that life had brought you into. When you thought, where is God? Where are my promises? Where are my answers? What have I been wrong about? What else might I be wrong about? If what I thought, if what I could have swore I knew is just, it, it, it breaks down on me. Well, now what? What do I do? And you pray to God and it's just like heaven is sealed shut. And your theology says he has not left me nor forsaken me, but it feels that way. And when I think, well, I'll, this is what I, I'll do, and pst, no, you won't. What do you do? What do you do? Well, here's what Peter did. He fell a little deeper in the hole, and he denied three times, he even knew the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Bible says this. When that rooster crowed, Jesus Christ, bloodied, beaten, tied, chained, twisted around in his bonds, and locked eyes with Simon Peter. The falling, failed, cursing, denying, so-called stone. And Peter looked back into the face of Jesus. What do you think he saw in the face of Jesus? Oh, Jesus looked back at him and he said, did you read, read his facial expressions under the bruises and under the blood? What did the face of Jesus say to Simon, the so-called stone? Oh, Simon, how could you? Oh, Simon, what a disappointment you are. Oh, Simon, here I am and look at you. Oh, Simon, where's your brag? Where's your little puny sword now? Simon, Simon, Simon. I'm so disappointed. I'm so ashamed at you. Is that what he would see in the face of Jesus? Absolutely not. Did Jesus not tell him ahead of time? 
Did Jesus not know everything about it already? And was Jesus not on his way to the cross to die for the sins of Simon? Then what did Simon see in the face of Jesus? He saw what he always saw in the face of Jesus Christ. Love, Amen. compassion, and mercy. That's right. That's what he saw. And that is what sifted Peter. You know, if Jesus had spoken angry words back at him, maybe he could have stood there. You know, yeah, I deserve it. You know. But to look back at him with love and mercy and compassion was just more than his old heart could take. And that's why he went out and wept bitterly. He didn't weep because Jesus was going to die. He, I mean, that's, that's later. He wept because he himself was such an abject failure. Now listen, this is important. He wept these bitter tears. He just went out in the bushes and just wretched out his soul and he sobbed and he cried and he groaned and he, he wept and he was a complete messy disaster there on the side of the road out in the bushes just completely heartbroken. And here's why. Because Peter had a desire. Peter wanted to be that man. He wanted to be loyal, faithful, self-sacrificial, compassionate. He wanted to be strong. He wanted to be, have a strong faith. He wanted to say, Jesus, I really am. He wanted to be like the Lord. He wanted to serve. He wanted to be more than he was. That's why he cries. He's so disappointed in himself. He's so disgusted in himself. That his old broken heart just weeps and weeps and weeps. Now, this is an amazing thing that fallen, broken humanity still craves, yearns, and desires the holiness of God Almighty. Have you been there? Have you, have you, been, have you said... I'm not worried about God being disappointed. You can't disappoint God because he already knows what's going to happen. But you can disappoint yourself, can't you? You can fail yourself. Look, we all have, we all have a self-image. We, we all have standards that we set for ourselves. This is not just what I do. This is who I am. I am this person. And this person lives this way. And these, uh, this, this is my set of ethics and morals and, uh, and moral standards. And this is what I will do and what I will not do. This is the person that I am and the person that I want to become. And this is it. And when you and I break our own standards of conduct, when we disappoint ourselves, when we say, this is who I am, I'll come to find out, oh, no, we're way down here somewhere. That is what eats our lunch. That is what destroys us. That's what sifts us. We know we'll never re meet uh, the standards of God, right? I mean, that's, we'll never measure up to his standards. But we all have our own standards. And I, I, I thought I was this man. I thought I was this person. I thought I knew these things. I thought I had these qualities, these characters. And by the way, all of those things that you and I have that are good and wholesome, right? All of these things, all of these characteristic traits that we, that we like about ourselves as Christians. Every single one of those trace back to the character of Jesus. <clears throat> now you want to be like Jesus. You may not have ever registered, but if you have a desire in your heart... That you want to be good, you want to be moral, you want to be ethical, you want to be compassionate, you want to be courageous, you want to be fearless, you want to be trustworthy, you want to be honest, you want to be hardworking, you want to be determined and long-suffering, you want to be forgiven, 
and forgiving. You want all these things. It's evidence that God really is doing a work in you. That is a picture of the image of God that he made in you once when he made you in the first place and he recreated you again with the image of Christ, the character of Christ when you were born again, turned into a new creature and, and born into the family of God. You inherited the nature and the characteristic of your spiritual family. Amen. And that's what that stuff is doing down in your heart. You want to be better. You want to be more. You want to be a better servant of God. You want to be a better version of yourself than you have been. That's the point. That's why Peter was crying. And that's why we cry, why we have griefs and sorrows. Let me read you something from the book of Isaiah. Sometime today you should read Isaiah chapter 53. Go ahead and read the whole chapter. It's absolutely amazing. But I want to read to you verse 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs. And carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes, we are healed. Now you listen to what he said. He was wounded for my transgressions, bruised for my iniquities. Jesus died for my sins. But that's not all he died for. He had to die for your sins because he died for you. For you. But remember what verse 4 says. He has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. It's not, just my, it's not just my blatant sins against God that Christ died for. He died for my grief and my sorrow. He died for Peter's tears. He died for Peter's broken heart. He died for, Peter, for Peter's self-disappointment. He died for all of that stuff that's not fit for God's good heaven. And that's exactly why it set Jesus Christ on this road in the first place. He's there to die for us. My grief, he'll carry. My sorrow, he'll pick up. And he'll die for that. Along with my sins and failures and disappointments. Inequities. All that stuff. He's not just going to die for your sins. He's going to die for your heart. And remember what Jesus said originally. After the devil had said, I'll sift them and I will prove that they are nothing. And from time to time, we get proven before God and ourselves that we're nothing. The minute I think I know something... God reminds me how ignorant I really am. You think you, think you know something the Bible says? Take heed lest you fall. You're next. I had a, a lady actually tell me in church one time, Brother Johnny, everybody else may not stick with you, but I'm, I'm there. And I just cringed because I thought of Peter. Sure enough. But sis, give yourself about three or four years and check back. We can't make that brag. It's humbling, isn't it? Oh, I'm going to serve the Lord. Hey, look. God called preacher. The Lord's anointed right here. Amen? Yeah. Gifted pastor and preacher. Oh. Mm -mm 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 -mm. No. Come on. Sinner. Right. Denier. Failure. Lump of mud. But Come on. Get to the right here. 
I have an advocate in heaven. Amen. Got a Savior who prays for me. And with his stripes, I am healed. And there's a way out of the hole. Amen? Amen. And the way out of that hole. With his stripes, I am healed. And Jesus told Peter ahead of time, he said, Peter, <laughs> going to be rough for a while. He said, but when you return to me, when, not if, because he knew the whole story. Peter, when you return to me, okay, when you have your revival, your renewal, when, when God delivers you from that pit, when he has humbled you enough, when he's kicked all the props out from under you, when you've had all that stuff stripped away from you and you didn't know which way was up, when you felt like God had abandoned you, you'll find out at the end of the tunnel that the light still shines, God's still with you, you have an advocate in, in heaven, and you're all welcome to just come back to Christ and repent and be forgiven and be cleansed and be restored and renewed. And then have I got plans for you because I've managed to get all that junk out of the way. Now I've got someone I can use. Happened to Peter. Happened to Paul. It's happened to us. From time to time a shepherd has a rebellious little lamb. Hmm? He just won't stay put. He's always wandering off. Well the shepherd can't have that because he knows about thieves, wolves, cliffs, Fast running streams, briar patches. And he can't have his little lamb running off. So the shepherd takes this little lamb and he takes his rod. Takes that little lamb and he takes that rod and he, he breaks a leg. Breaks a leg. Well, now the shepherd's got a problem because the little lamb can't walk anymore. Now the herd's got to go, right? And so the shepherd, what's he got to do? He's got to take this little lamb with his broken leg and he tucks it inside his cloak, cloak right here. And he has to, wherever they go, the shepherd has to carry this little lamb all day, every day. All day, every day. While the little lamb's leg heals back up. So that, by the time the lamb's leg is healed, and the shepherd puts him back down. That little lamb will never leave the side of the shepherd again. He's been trained. He's been conditioned. He said, no, I, I don't live out there. I live right here. In the heart of the shepherd. You know what those holes are for? So that the Lord Jesus Christ can gather what's left of you up. And tuck you right here next to his heart. And carry you all the days of your life. Amen. That's what your advocate does for you. That's what your savior does for you. He's still there. He has never left you nor forsaken. Doesn't, doesn't matter how you feel. Doesn't matter what your circumstances look like. Doesn't matter how cold your prayers have gotten, how dry and stale the word of God's gotten. None of that matters because you still have God's promise. From the depths, Jonah said, from the depths, I cry out to you. And we find at the end of the day, at the end of the tunnel, that leg is healed. And we don't want our props back anymore. And those pieces of our ego and, uh, and the pride that we had in our faith in our own faith and goodness we don't ever want that jump back again because we have learned that without him we can do nothing and we have learned that it's not about what we do it's not what we think it's not about what we know. It's about living close to the heart of Jesus. It's about Him. It's about Him. And that's all life is about. Just Him. Amen? Amen. Amen. 
Thank you, dear Lord. Lord, we've all been those uh, broke leg lambs. And uh, looked like we were, we, we, we felt like we'd come to the end, Lord. We did know what we'd do. We've been confused and frustrated, disappointed, broken. Felt hopeless. Lord, we want to say thank you that even in the midst of all that, that you still loved and cared, that you knew it all, that you still died for us. But Lord, you carry the burden of our sorrows and griefs, not just the burden of our heinous sins against you. So Lord, teach us to walk close to you, to let you carry us along. Teach us, Lord, that uh, faith is good, good works are good, doing the right thing and learning is great. Well, Lord, help us to remember that the whole reason for all of it, the point, is that we live close to your heart. Lord, forgive us the times that we have failed you. And Lord, we pray for those who are struggling even now. They are frustrated and they don't know what's going on. They can't get their prayers answered. And they wonder where you are sometimes, Lord. So Lord, for these dear and precious souls, we ask an extra measure of grace. We ask, Lord, that you'll give them a little glimmer of that light at the end of the tunnel. That these things and these days will not last forever. But there is a future and that there is a hope. There is a renewed sense of faith and peace in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your promises that cannot be shaken, Lord. In Jesus' holy and lovely name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.